Well, welcome back to our Advent series where we've been looking through the eyes of the people who experienced the first Christmas. The last two weeks, we looked at the obedience of Joseph, and then we heard Mary sing her Magnificat, her song of praise uh, and, and gratefulness to God for honoring and allowing her to be the mom of, no small thing, of the Savior of the world. This morning we're going to look at a group of outcasts. So do me a favor, if you haven't already, please open your Bibles or Bible devices to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 and verse 1. Let me remind you, uh, we have extra Bibles on our communion tables around the room if for some reason you don't have one or you're like, I would love to give a Bible to somebody. They are free for the taking. So... Grab one of those. Luke chapter 2 and verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quinarius was governor of Syria, and, and everyone went to their own town to register. Verse 4, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house of in line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Uh, let's stop here for a second because there is an assumption about the birth story of Jesus that we need to clear up. Um, our favorite Christmas carols completely romanticize the night of his birth, making it seem like um, uh, gentle, genteel, precious moments uh, event rather than uh, um, a chaotic, inconvenient, um, oh my word, she's having a baby moment that it was. For example, silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Have you ever uh, been present for the birth of a baby? I have been present um, for all of ours. Uh, none of them were silent nights. All was not calm. Uh, all was not bright. Even after the epidural, um, all was not calm and all was not bright. Beautiful, amazing, uh, transformative, but not um, calm and bright. Or how about away in the manger? Think about this line. The cattle are lowing. The poor baby wakes. The little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Hmm. If you are um, if on the first night of your newborn baby's life, he wakes up in a cave with barnyard animals looking at him, do you honestly think no crying he makes? Verse 8, and there were shepherds, underline that, living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at, at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. You may recall that Jim said last week, anytime an angel showed up, again, it wasn't um, a genteel moment. It was a please don't kill me moment. And they always had to kind of clarify who we are and what we're about. But the angel said to them, oh, wait a sec, I'm not here to kill you, not this time. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David has been born, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Uh, this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, beyond the actual angel right there, a great company of the heavenly host, more angels appeared with that angel praising God. And they began to sing in unison glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to, uh, peace to those on whom his favor rests. This morning, we're going to look uh, at the first Christmas through the eyes of of these guys right here, shepherds who worship and share the good news. There were lots of people to whom the angelic choir could have chosen to appear that first Christmas Eve. They, they could have appeared um, in the luxurious palace of, of Herod, the acting king of Israel at that time, located just a few miles away, actually one of 15 palaces, but one of his big ones was just right around the corner. They could have chosen Rome. Anyone ever been to Rome? Raise your hand if you've been to Rome. Yeah, I've been to Rome. Amazing. Just like Rome, I think would have been a better place, right? They could have chosen the high priest chambers. I've been there too in the temple of Jerusalem. Like, wow. Uh, instead, they chose to uh, announce Jesus' birth to a group of unnamed illiterate shepherds 
in an unnamed field in an unknown part of Israel. And don't miss what they said. Peace on earth to the people he favors. Now, based uh, on who they chose to appear to, who is it that God favors? Well, it's shepherds. Shepherds. And who are these shepherds? Well, we can say with all certainty, all confidence, that they were a group that was unlikely to be chosen. The shepherds were were weird. They lived by themselves outside of town, sleeping in the open with animals, like all the time. That's not the job you shoot for. That's the job you you end up with. Additionally, they they couldn't make it to temple for sacrifice and and feast because they couldn't abandon their flocks, so they weren't able to to maintain religious devotion like the rest of of God's people did. Furthermore, some would say that um, many of them were crooks and, and thieves. They were a suspicious bunch. They weren't even allowed to testify in court because um, they were considered, all of them were considered liars. They are, con- they are considered the lowest of the low. And yet, of all the people in the world, God chose to uh, announce the birth of Jesus to, to them. Now, what does that show us about those whom he favors? Well, um, Here's what I, I kind of pulled from this. There are three types of, of people that Jesus really favors all, all the time, but especially at, at, at Christmas time. The first type of people that he favors are poor people. In sending the angels to the shepherds, God was declaring that he sees and that he cares for the poor. Um, please, please, this is so important that we get this down. Poverty is not a sign that God has forsaken you. If that were the case, three quarters of the world would have been forsaken by God. Poverty is not a sign that God has forsaken you or that your life is second class or that you have no future. He has something for you. He wants to bless you and use your life for good. That starts with giving you something even better than riches, even better than money. You see, Jesus taught that the abundant life is is not first and foremost about houses or riches or, or cars or 401ks. Um, or success, but it's about knowing God. Ironically, Jesus said the poor are usually in, in a better situation to receive the abundant life. Why? Because their, their hands and their minds aren't so full of money or, or wealth that they have no, no yearning for God. I'm always reminded of the words of Agar in Proverbs chapter 30. He prays this incredible prayer. It's like, God, don't, don't give me so much money that literally I say, who is God? Who is God? I'm reminded of Jesus' words later on in the Gospels where he says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter into, the, into heaven. You say, man, they must have been filthy rich. We're richer than that rich person. Like far richer than that rich person. If you are poor this Christmas or down on your luck, Believe it or not, I can offer you something better than, than money. I can offer you God himself. By the way, at New Heights, we, want, we, we would want uh, to know about your physical needs, and we would love to help you if you need help. But more importantly, we can offer you the assurance that you're at peace with God, and that heaven and all its riches are yours, that he will begin working in your life for good and to use you to bless others and give you the life um, you, you really need. And it, once you experience it, the life you really want. We'll talk more about that later. So um, Jesus favors the poor, but he also favors broken people. Shepherds were not a group of people who had it all together. They didn't graduate at the top of their classes. Nobody looked at them as exemplary or came to them for life advice. They were people whose lives had gone off the rails, yet God favored them. Maybe you feel like this. Maybe you feel that when you come to church, and this makes me sad if you do, on any given Sunday, or maybe you go to a group, and you show up, and you're like, everyone else has it all together. I'm a mess. I'm a mess. Maybe it's your career, your relationships. Maybe you're struggling with addictions, and you're embarrassed about it. And it makes you avoid close relationships. 
or you just stay hidden and guarded in relationships. Maybe you have an Instagram presence, but you know it's not the real you. Write this down. Jesus favors the real you. Jesus sees the real you. Not the fake Instagram you, but the the real you. Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the King, one and only King of the universe, favors you. He is someone who can help with your problems. Why? Because he has all authority over them. No one else does. You're like, if only my boss. No. Well, if my wife or husband could just. No. Well, I'm seeing a counselor. Helps, but no. I had more stuff. Nope. He is someone who can help us with all of our problems because only he has authority over them. He can guide you through problems. Why? Because he knows the end from the beginning. He can guide you through darkness. Why? Because he is the light. We're studying that right now in the Gospel of John. He can lead you through the valley of death. Why? Because he's been through death and back again. Jesus favors poor people. Jesus favors broken people. And thirdly, he he favors forgotten people. Shepherds felt forgotten by society, even by their families. You would not catch um, parents um, bragging about their shepherd's sons at parties. Have I told you about my son, the shepherd? You know, you you never heard that. What you may have heard was a slightly different tone. Have I told you about my son? Ugh. He's a shepherd. He's a shepherd. Sorry about that. For all practical purposes, they were invisible to society, yet God favored them. Maybe some of you feel that way this Christmas. You're like, I feel forgotten, overlooked. Maybe you're like, if you could describe me in one word, it would be invisible and not in a good sense. Maybe you're watching this service online like right now because you have no one else. The good news is that all of the people to whom God could have sent the angelic choir that evening, he chose the forgotten. He said to them very loudly that night outside of Bethlehem, I see you. I see you. I love this verse in the Psalms. It's one of my favorite all-time verses because it's an intimate I I see you verse. Psalm 56 and and verse 8. It's so intimate it feels a little awkward. Maybe not for women, but for men. I love it. The psalmist says, in referring to he being a child of God, us being a child of God, he says, you keep track of all my sorrows. You've collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. It's like, God, you, you have a tear and sorrow book for me? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I, re- I remember the home you grew up in mom and dad yelling at each other, and I remember you'd cry yourself to sleep. I captured those. I was thinking about you. I remember that abusive marriage you were in. I remember that. And then the shame you experienced after divorce, and people didn't understand what you'd gone, I, I was right there. I remember all those dreams and expectations that you had, but life got in the way. And now you're like, I'm a loser. No one thinks about me. God, I do. This is so important for us to understand. All of us ache to be special to somebody. Beloved, we are special to him. Do, Do we yearn to matter? We matter to him. In in, in all our pursuits, 
we've ever gone on, whether we knew it or not, the ache in our heart was an ache for him. When I was a boy and then even a teenager, um, I'd spend some time with my dad. And invariably, about three or four cocktails in, um, he'd begin to get really honest with me. And if you knew my father, and some of you know of him vicariously through what I've said, but he was a bucketless man. He did everything, accomplished everything, spoke different languages, traveled the world, raced boats, raced cars, made millions, all that stuff. But a couple cocktails in, he'd sit there and he'd go, almost Solomon-esque. He's like, Lee Jr., there's got to be more. There's got to be more. The acceptance that we've longed for from our family and friends is found in hearing him say, you are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. These angels are are poor, they are broken, they are forgotten. And yet the angelic host shows up to them. So how do they respond? Like, you know, we always have to respond when embraced with the holy. It could be good, it could be bad, it could be neutral, but we all have to respond. Well, here's how they respond. Verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Verse 16, so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. Verse 18, all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The shepherds respond in in two ways. First way, very simply, proclamation. Again, verse 17, when they had seen him, baby Jesus, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. Did a little word study here. Uh, The phrase, they spread the word, means to make known in such a way that people can understand. In other words, I'll say this twice. These simple men simplified the greatest message ever told so other simple people could simply understand it. Let me say it again. These simple men, these are not educated men. Simplify the greatest message ever told so other people could simply understand it. There's no more strategic time than right now in this season to share this simple message with people around you. And please hear this. You don't have to know Hebrew. You don't have to know Greek. You're like, well, you went to seminary. Did you learn Hebrew and Greek? I did. Guess what? I forgot it. I forgot it. You don't have to be Jim Hall. You don't have to be Billy Graham. You don't. What do you have to be? Transparent. Tell people what Jesus did for you. Just tell them. I love the, the we're going to get to this in the Gospel of John, the blind man in John chapter 10. He's just like, I was blind. Now I see. <laughs> They're like, damn. Who did? Jesus did that. Yeah, but. No, yeah, buts. I was blind. Now I see. I was lost. Now I'm found. I did this. I don't do that. I'm not perfect, but Jesus loves me anyways. Share that story. Hey, you've never saved anybody in your life. It's the Spirit of God taking the Word of God, bringing conviction, and people respond. It's not you. There's no turn of phrase. There's no apologetic defense of your faith where you said exactly the right thing that someone will stop and went, good point, you nailed it. I'm confessing Jesus right now. You just lay out the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus with your story and and let the Holy Spirit take over. You say, well, what do I got to do? Well, that, um, but you actually have to do it. (laughs) 
Notice the message they shared had nothing to do with the amazing angels or the magnificence of Mary. Isn't it funny how we do? Or they didn't venerate Joseph. We as believers, we get so caught up in everything but Jesus. They came to see the Savior, and now they headed out to proclaim the good news about him. Get this, and to me, this is a cool thought. Take it for what it's worth. It's behind you. Um, I, we're here today because they couldn't keep quiet. I know, can I get a little hallelujah for that? <laughs> they, like, they couldn't shut their mouths. When I get to heaven, um, I'm taking those guys aside, and I'm saying, thank you, shepherds. Thank you, Morty the shepherd. Uh, wait in line. People have been doing this for 2,000 years. I'll, I'll wait in line. It's striking that they don't pull up a bale of straw and make themselves comfortable. Instead, here's what they do. They head out to share the message from the manger. They don't hang around the manger because as the world's first missionaries, they had a job to do. Verse 18 describes how the people responded. I love this. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. To be amazed means to, um, and maybe your translation has it, these actual words. This is the NIV. Means to wonder and be astonished. It's used 12 times throughout the Gospel of Luke. And every single time it's in response to Jesus. Every single time, it's Jesus doing something that's so unbelievable and amazing. People go, I, I'm astonished at that. This is a challenge to us, right? Especially during the season. When we encounter the, Jesus afresh in the Christmas story, let me just ask you this. Are you still amazed and astonished? Well, I would be if I wasn't fighting traffic. Well, if it wasn't for family, whew. You know how many presents I got to wrap? You know how many stocking stuffers I got to wrap? You know how, I got to go back to the mall. Quick kids, gather around. Let's get the Christmas story out of the way and let's get to the good stuff. One of the reasons we do Advent is to stop and slow down and just soak it all in and go, okay, this is amazing. God with us. God with us. First way they responded, proclamation. I got to tell somebody. I got I got to tell somebody. Second way, worship. Verse 20. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things um, they had heard and, and seen, which were just as they had been told. They didn't just wonder about what they saw, that they worshiped him. In one sense, they're taking the place of the angels uh, as they now glorify and, and, and praise God. Please hear this, and I want you to see it. This isn't to bring judgment, um, but does bring tension. One clear evidence of conversion is a commitment to worship. in all its forms, all its forms. It could be creation, it could be song, it could be word, it could be acts. I'm gonna step on some toes now, but I'll, I'll hear people say, you know, when I come to New Heights, I, I just come to hear the message, I try and miss the worship, the singing part, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. I'm a worship guy, hands up in the air, praising like I just don't care, but the word, I, I don't know. Doesn't make any sense. When a person is genuinely a follower of Jesus, he or she will seek to bring glory to God and gather with his people to praise him for who he is and what he has done. Let me say that again. When a person is genuinely a follower of Jesus, he or she will seek to bring glory to God and gather with his people to praise him for who he is and what he has done. When I was 17, I got invited to a youth group, and uh, 
other than the Holy Spirit convicting and drawing and wooing, I was like, what is going on? This is freaky. This is weird. I'm like, I'm out. I leave. I keep coming back because of pretty girls. I go to revival. I get saved. Next thing you know, I'm like, God, why? The Spirit of God lives inside of me. I, it's my response. Is it a process? Was I sanctified? Yes. But I went from don't want to hear it to I can't stop proclaiming it. This Christmas, allow yourself to adore Emmanuel as you glorify and praise him for all you have seen and heard. We can and we will return to the same place after Christmas, but not as the same person. Not as the same person. Will the prayer team please come up at this time? If you're on the prayer team, come on up. I'm going to have you stand around the room for just a few minutes. And while they're coming up, do me a favor. Let's go back to Luke chapter 2 and verse 11 just one more time. I think this is really important. I don't want us to miss this. Luke chapter 2 and, and verse 11, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is the Messiah or the Christ, the anointed one. He's the Lord. So I just want to make this personal, because it's easy to gloss over this, and I think the enemy wants us to do that. But let me just, um, three questions, and I'll put them all up at once. It's easy to deflect at this time. We're, all, we're going to grandma and grandpa's for Christmas. They really love Jesus. Hanging out with mom and dad, they love Jesus. Is he savior to you? Is he Messiah to you? Is he your Lord? The late um, Corey Ten Boom, a, a Nazi camp survivor, once said this. She said, if Jesus were born 1,000 times in Bethlehem and not in me, I would still be lost. Here's what the enemy does and our culture does to a certain extent. Let's make Christianity about a moment where a cute little baby is born. I can manage that. Lights, presents, family, food. But that's not what Christmas is about. Here's the question for you and I. Is Jesus born in us? The language, again, we saw this in the Gospel of John, John chapter 3 is... Jesus talking to a, a very religious person who understood traditions. Nicodemus, it's not about doing this or saying this or presenting a certain way or going to this. Nicodemus, have you been born from above? Have you been born again? So maybe you're here this morning and you're like... I think I've been hiding behind the mistletoe all my life or another Hallmark Christmas special, right? And I need to be born again. If you're here, um, here's what I want to do. I want to just do me a favor, bow your heads right now. I mean, you certainly can keep your eyes open or you can close them. It's up to you. That doesn't bother me either way. But I'm going to very slowly walk through um, a, a prayer and if this is where you're at, in your heart, in your mind and heart, just re repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I admit I have been asleep spiritually. Thank you for waking me up right now in this moment. 
I don't understand how you can love me when I don't measure up. I confess I am a sinner and I, I repent by turning from the way I have been living. I need you. I need you, Jesus, to be my Savior. So, please save me from my sins and from myself. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are God. I desire to live under your Lordship for the rest of my life. Thank you for not only being born, but for dying in my place and rising again so that I can be born again. I now receive the gift of salvation and forgiveness by asking you to come into my life. Please make me into the person you want me to be by enabling me to bring glory to you and salvation to others. And I prayed in your name, Jesus. Amen. You can look up here. It's Advent. So we're going to finish this, this talk together, you and I with some, some responsive reading. You, you know what we do. For the moment, I'm leader, you're people. <laughs> Let's do this. Let's do this together as we continue to worship Jesus. Under a quiet sky, the Savior of the world has been born. In a manger, lowly and humble, the Lord of the universe lays. God is with us in flesh, bone, and an infant's cry. The world, the Lord has come. His name is Jesus, and he's come to rescue the lost. His name is Jesus, and he's come to set the captives free. His name is Jesus, and he's come to make all things new. Joy to the world. The name of Jesus, nations will bow. At the name of Jesus, the broken shall be made whole. At the name of Jesus, the blind shall see. Let every sorrowful heart rejoice. Joy to the world. In a dusty stable lays the infant Messiah. Yes, God's unrelenting love and great mercy continues to pursue his people with meekness and majesty. God has come to dwell among his people. Joy to the world. He's come to defeat the darkness. He's come to defeat death. He's come to reign, and he has come to set all things right. Joy to the world. So lift up your faces towards the dawn. A new light presses into our world. Arise to meet your maker. Arise to meet your king. Joy to the world. Amen. Maybe you're here this morning, and a few minutes ago you, you prayed what I just prayed and you're like what are next steps for me I would encourage you to go to talk go and talk with somebody on the prayer team and tell them what you've done and then let's talk about what it means to to study God's word together and be discipled maybe you're here this morning and you're you're like I'm still not sure I need to talk to somebody they're all around the room they'd love to do that maybe you just you just want to just pray with somebody it's it's the Christmas season, and it's complicated. And for some, it's the greatest season ever. For others, it triggers sorrow and heartache and brokenness, and I'm sorry for that. And where two or more are gathered, he's in our midst, and you just need to pray with somebody. For others, you just, you just want to testify. You just want to share with somebody the good things that God's, that God's doing. I, Ruth and I have got some good things in our life. You can pray for us. We're grandparents for the first time. I know. I know. Somebody said, you'll be the greatest grandparents ever. I said, I think you're right. <laughs> uh, just um, so you know, not that you have to know, Ruth will be called Bubby. That's Yiddish. Not Bubba, Bubby. And I'll be called Saba which is Hebrew, not Shaba. That would be a charismatic grandfather. I'm Saba. Um, so pray for us. And more so, pray for um, Noah and Madeline. It's a very, very exciting time. Uh, and make sure when you see him, you let him know and congratulate him. Father, we love you. We can't stop thinking about you. And as, as we looked at the text, I'm convicted 
it's easy to get so caught up in the repetition of this season that we, we no longer have wonder and awe like those shepherds. Forgive us for that. Restore unto us wonder and awe. Emmanuel, God is with us.